are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. Name one, Mr. Nice Guy. Shame I'm not sure this is a great idea. Order. Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. I'm joined by my co-host, Conrad. Hello. And in this episode, we are delighted to be joined by Zachary Marsh, who is running to be an NUS delegate for the University of Cambridge. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, it's brilliant to be here. Um, so to begin with, the first thing I'd like to ask is, why did you decide to run for the NUS? Um, well, it's something I've, I've considered for a while, actually. I think that the NUS has a certain reputation and it's, it's sad because a lot of the sort of student politics reputations when you get into it are often undeserved, but the NUS definitely deserves the kind of image and caricature of itself that it's created. You know, it, it's an incredibly sort of ideological body. Uh, it doesn't really work on student issues anymore. It's far more concerned about pursuing its own sort of grandstanding agenda. Um, and it's something I, I've been very frustrated with for a long time. And more broadly, I've dabbled in student politics. I'm involved in sort of, at Cambridge we have colleges, and I'm involved at a college level in student politics there. And there are just very broad themes, certainly at my university, and I think generally, of disengagement, apathy amongst the student body. And that's abused by people in student politics to push a radical agenda because no one's there to sort of democratise student politics and hold them to account. And that's really what my campaign is about. It's not even necessarily winning. It's about broadening the appeal of student politics, talking about to students in a sort of rational, pragmatic way about actually what we want to see happening and sort of pulling the rug out from underneath these people who use it as a soapbox for their own very narrow, very radical political views. So um, what specific things do you think the, N- the NUS has got wrong in the um, last few years? Well, I think, I think two things stand out. I hesitate, I hesitate to use this first example because it's just overused. But the whole thing about, you know, the NUS talks about things which very definitely have no at least direct impact on students. Things like, you know, boycotting Israel, where they've passed a vast number of, sort of resolutions on that. Um, and it's, you know, I, I'm all for working on student issues, but I think that's what student unions should be about. It should be about things that lobbying for the sort of student interest in a way that doesn't encompass wider campaigns. And as someone who I, I was a former member of Youth Parliament, so I've been involved in this sort of side of things for a long time. And the argument they always present is that for some reason, um, oh, you know, students have broader political interests and this is one of them. And I'm, yeah, OK, but I think students are active they're engaged in single issue politics if they want to do something like that that's better pursued through a sort of broader organization um like friends of palestine um and that, that's where that should be done through not through our student union the other thing i point to which is a really sort of current example and what i'm very concerned about is that the nus is actually in real financial difficulty at the moment and i'm, I'm very rarely complimentary of nus SABS officers but they did put together a really sort of tough but really, I thought, pragmatic budget last year where they made the cuts they needed to make in order to return the NUS solvency. And then at conference, a load of delegates on an ideological agenda because they just don't like the concept of sort of austerity and appreciating the idea that the NUS might need to exist within sort of a budget, um, voted it down because they said, oh, it's, you know, conservative neoliberal economic policies. You don't have to agree with that, which is just ludicrous because ultimately every single organisation has to remain within its finances. And so I, I'm very keen to just have provide a sort of rational voice, which is not necessarily political in any way, but let's says actually let's crack on with student issues, let's be sensible about these things, and let's not treat it as a sort of ideological playground, which I think is what it is at the moment for a lot of people. Um, now in your manifesto you say that uh, one of your aims is to campaign for real change on the cost of living, student rents and student voices in universities. How would you um, be able to instigate change in those areas if you were elected? <laughs> Well, I think I think a big part of it, as I said, is about refocusing the agenda, because I, I don't believe for a moment, in, in fairness to the current sort of body of NUS delegates, that anyone particularly disagrees with those goals. I think a lot of people that are sent to the NUS from various universities really do feel passionately about acting on those issues. But the problem is that they allow their sort of political ideologies to cloud their judgment, and they spend far, far longer considering motions, like I said, like boycotting Israel and things like that, um, than they do actually trying to come up with detailed policy proposals. I think the other thing I would do is I think that the NUS and student politics more generally has become very antagonistic to government in recent years. And I'm, I'm a big believer that ultimately in politics, you've got to work with power 
Um, and I think that actually I would be pushing for us to be slightly more conciliatory on a purely practical level to ensure that, you know, when we speak to government, when we speak to decision makers, they aren't just immediately put off by the image of the NUS itself, which I think is a real problem at the moment. Do you think that um, some so, sort of there are sort of this sort of groundswell of similar people to you who are getting elected NUS and that you could work with, or do you think you're going to be more of a voice in the wind this time, but still standing up for the beliefs you believe in? I think there's going to be. Um, I, I think I'm not well enough connected, frankly, to be able to tell, to speak for sort of the NUS sort of sort of movement that I'm part of across the country. I think we did see that very interesting period, which I think went too far. Um, a few years back, which sort of spearheaded by Tom Harwood, um, where, you know, there was a period of sort of NUS backlash. Um, and I think it went too far because I think it was sort of appropriated to push a, their own ideological agenda, which is something I think is self-defeating. You know, what, what they were essentially, they said, oh, look, you're all very left wing, very radical. And what we should actually be doing is then being conservative, which I think is, again, entirely the wrong position to take. I think it's about focusing on student issues. What is very interesting, and I can only speak from my experience, is that in Cambridge, um, I don't know if you followed the news, but more broadly at a sort of university level student politics, um, the, the student union has come into a lot of flack recently. It very badly handled the strikes. There was a there was a big scandal about the um, disabilities officer at our students union um, urging students not to go to counselling services because that meant crossing picket lines, which was A, untrue, there were no picket lines, and B, if a student's having a mental breakdown, I think that's more important than strike solidarity. Um, and recently they made a move to ban military societies, to, you know, the officer training corps on the university, which thankfully was, was shut down out of student outrage. Um, so I think at Cambridge, at least, there's a really exciting sort of groundswell at the moment to sort of hit back at sort of this quite radical establishment um, in student politics, start bringing in new voices and new people who have potentially felt disengaged and actually just say, that, let's make student politics about students again. I think that's a really positive change. Why do you think that there is a feeling or a sense that in regards to student politics, and you mentioned um, some examples there, that uh, people who are perhaps not students or even uh, some students like yourself feel disenfranchised by what they see as the establishment as such? Do you think that it's down to sort of like a, a more shift in terms of ideological differences because as a reaction against government or do you think that student politics has always leaned in one particular ideological direction um it's interesting i i don't want to give an unqualified opinion because i'm no no sort of expert on sort of the history of student politics i think i think we got two real problems in student politics at the, at the moment in this sort of last decade or so i think the first is that students broadly speaking have always been left wing and the people who go into student politics are very conscious of that. And so they run on sort of left wing manifestos, which is which is absolutely fine to sort of symbolize to the bulk of students, you know, I, I'm with you. But the problem is that actually they're often far more radical speaking to students. I know who are of a sort of more 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 progressive persuasion. They're often far more radical um, than the student body actually wants them to be when they get into power. Um, and they just know how to sort of send out the right messaging in election time. I think the other real problem is that I think student politics and just the, the inherent nature of the way it operates is quite undemocratic. So um, in, in Cambridge University, for example, there are sort of about 25 officers in the student union. And what's quite bizarre is that actually when those 25 are elected, they essentially then go and sit in a room and they decide what they want the entire student population of the university to, to be like and to feel like in the student culture. And that's an awful lot of power to concentrate, A, in the hands of a small group, even if there was huge engagement. But given at least half that group are often elected on, you know, vote shares of like 200 votes in a, in a university of 30,000 um, students in total, if you include graduates, um, that's really quite concerning. Um, and I think... We can't entirely blame student union um, officials and student politics for that. I think that students ourselves have to take some responsibility for our apathy. I do think that's a fair, fair comment. But I do think that there's been a, a lack of engagement and a sense that actually it's not the responsibility of student politicians to engage with students where they want to be engaged with. Um, and I think that's really, really bad for student society and sort of university politics in general. 
Now, if you um, get elected to the NUS, um, you will get a vote on the next NUS president and leadership team. Um, firstly, sort of, there's two parts to this question. What kind of person would you want to see leading the NUS? And secondly, do you support the calls for moving to a one student, one vote system where every student would get a vote on it if their university is a member of the NUS? Um, I'm, I'll actually answer the, I'll answer the sort of second question first, if I may. Uh, I think that... I think it's, it's I think it's a good idea. I, I, I'm slightly sceptical, however, because uh, as I said, I think the issues that I just raised about sort of apathy and stuff. I, I appreciate the desire to move towards democratisation, and I have to study the proposals carefully. But I think if you're going to do that, we need to look far more closely about how we're actually going to make that a practical improvement to ensure that actually we had high engagement. And I think until we can be sure that we've got a plan to facilitate that, I'm not sure it's actually the improvement that people are trying to spin it as. On the first point, you know, I, I, as I said, I want to be proactic, and more importantly, I don't want to be a sort of Burkean representative. Um, I'm very keen that the decisions I make will be so, some, somewhat reflective of the student body, because I think that's a real problem. I think, actually, there's a very Burkean model in student politics, where people assume that because they've got these votes on very low vote shares, they are now entirely entitled to pursue their own ideological leanings. And I think that's really bad, because even if you are a sort of centrist or a moderate, you're inherently conditioned sort of subconsciously to, to feel certain ways. And I, I'd be very keen to actually talk to the majority of students here and try and work out the kind of candidate they'd like. The one thing I am very keen to say, having said that, is that I would like to see a president and more SAVs officers who are actual um, students. There's been a worrying trend in recent years towards um, A, graduates, and I've got nothing against graduates, but to see people who are often quite a long way out of education. We've not had an undergraduate president in ages. We've had a lot of sort of late 20s, even sort of 30-year-old presidents of the NUS. And I think it'd be really good just simply so that people are closer to the reality that most students are living and can empathise more closely with that experience to actually reduce the age of some of our SABS officers, some of the NUS officers, to a point where they are, you know, undergraduate students again, because I do think that voice is missing. And I do think there's a sort of disconnect that comes from that. Uh, now, you mentioned the strikes earlier, and there were uh, strikes in December, and there may be some more uh, coming in a couple of weeks. How effective do you think that the strikes have been? And do you think that they have... I mean, what do you think the effect has been on the student body? Again, so I can only speak for Cambridge here, and I, I'm running I'm running a very localised campaign in that sense. I'm not sort of trying to articulate a sort of broader message for sh national student politics. I'm very much about improving representation in my university on a model I would obviously hope other people adapt, accept it, but that's sort of where I stand. I think in Cambridge, at least, uh, we've actually got another round of strikes starting, I think it's next week, or it might be the week after, um, which will be further disruptive. It was... It was... Not that effective here, to be quite honest. Um, as you said, there is a slight irony to the fact that all these people say that they're going on strike and then actually they pick it for sort of two hours and then they go home. Um, I, I study on the humanities site, which is where most of the striking lecturers were, um, and that was fairly well picketed. But um, the sort of science departments I know, speaking to friends who study those subjects, very few lecturers had actually stopped working and the picket lines were often just literally lying drawn in chalk by activists earlier in the day so i don't think they've been particularly effective that said i think that there is a real problem for humanity students and something I'm, I'm really unhappy with is the fact that our libraries all sit behind picket lines and so if if students want to honor strikes at the moment they essentially have to stop learning which i think is disgraceful um, a couple of my fellow candidates have spoken about the idea of getting a strike refund, and I am sympathetic to that, because I think that actually the people that are being hurt by these strikes are not the people that lecturers are trying to make the point to, it's students, who are actually often far more financially um, limited than the people striking, who actually this money means a lot more to them, and I think it's really, really bad that students are the one in the crosshairs of this movement. Um, I think in terms of the student reaction... I think actually that that's sort of been broadly it. I think there's a lot of support for the strikes and the idea of the strikes, but people don't like the way it's been done. They don't, at least at Cambridge, they really don't like the way the sort of very pro-strike, without any caveats position of the student union. 
Um, they don't know who's actually standing up for students um, at the moment in the strikes. And there's a sense of frustration about the students who are suffering being the ones that are actually just being left out of the conversation. And so I do think there's a sort of groundswell of thought that actually we do need better student representation. And I hope my campaign can be a part of that. So obviously you mentioned the strikes. Um, what other issues do you think are the primary ones sort of that need to be pushed to the focus in the NUS? In the US, so as I said, I, I, I think a really big one is the fact that we have not, and it, it genuinely horrifies me, is the, is the cost of living in universities, and it would probably be my number one thing. So unlike some people, I'm not entirely opposed to tuition fees. You know, we had a period where actually universities were chronically underfunded before tuition fees were brought in. I think they are pretty high, and I certainly wouldn't want to see them increased. But we do finally have universities, you know, with proper funding, um, and we're moving in the right direction in that sense. Uh, the problem is actually, though, is the way that universities are using that funding and the way that they are monetizing the rest of the student experience. So we're getting lots of swanky new buildings, which, you know, have a minimal imbent positive impact on students. I won't deny, but, you know, actually hiring more staff, um, increasing contact hours might have been a better way to use that money that's coming in from tuition fees. But what I find really disgraceful is if we're paying all this money, they shouldn't be attempting to monetize the sort of cost of living for students. So things like student rents are far too high. Cambridge has got really high student rents. I'm at Robinson College, actually, which has the highest rents in the entire University of Cambridge. Um, and that's a real problem here. And it's an access issue for students getting into Oxbridge. Um, and it's other things like, you know, my sis I've got a twin sister at the University of Birmingham. And their laundry facilities are abysmal between sort of three blocks of um, accommodation last year when she was in halls, they had a single laundry and the prices were sort of twice what you'd expect in a commercial laundry. And I, I think that if we are going to pay tuition fees at the rate we are paying them, universities should have an obligation to not attempt to squeeze more money out of students through the cost of living, because I do think that puts students off. And that's not paying for education, that's paying for essentially attending university. And that's not something that universities, in my opinion, should be able to exploit in the way that they currently do. Um, now, you mentioned that you're running quite a localised campaign. I wonder what's been the uh, reaction to your campaign so far? How positive has it been? What are the sort of interactions have you had with uh, other students? Well, the, well, the campaign has been really interesting. As I say, um, there's been this groundswell. You know, uh, apathy is starting to change here because people have the student union is finally getting the sort of bad press it deserves. And we have a real problem in this university, actually, which is that the two main student newspapers, one is directly funded through the student union and the other is pro student union. And the tab is, is, has a fairly sort of left wing slant to it. So it, it can be critical, but it isn't often. Um, and the result being that actually when, when the student union here and indeed the NUS make mistakes, it's not often covered in the student press, which has limited information. But recently, the, 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 the issues have been so glaring, they've been forced to. What my campaign is really about, and there are a couple of others um, running on similar concepts to me here, who I think are really great, um, is actually just taking an entirely different group of people and trying to get them into student politics. Because all of the people at the moment who vote are part of this sort of bubble of sort of student politics, student mindset sort of thing. And actually, Cambridge in particular has got a really thriving sort of broader student politics in sort of party politics. We've got the Cambridge Union, the, the really major debating society, which is the largest society in the university, um, where a lot of people are clearly interested in politics, but are cut off by student politics. And my campaign is actually about, in a sort of, oh, I hate to draw a parallel, but I think tactically there's, there's some truth to it, a sort of vote leave style thing where rather than trying to persuade the people who are already voting, I want to bring in new groups, you know, people in societies, people who have been turned off by student politics today and actually get them involved and have them vote for me rather than trying to persuade around this sort of core group that always votes, always engages. Because I think that way we expand the number of people interested in student politics and we bring new voices in, which I think, and, and, and frankly, in my opinion, slightly saner voices into the discussion, which I think can only be a good thing. You mentioned about sort of apathy. Um, do you think that um, getting involved in student politics is accessible to all students? No, oh, is the simple answer. I I'm very fortunate to have a friend who is friends with one of the student officers at the Cambridge University um, Student Union. And actually, she provided most of the information to my campaign in terms of when deadlines were. The email to sign up um, to run for NUS delegate was actually a generic um, uh, student union email. It was titled Our Successes, and you had to read to the bottom of a two-page email um, 
to find the link for any West Daliga, which was not included anywhere higher up. Um, and it's quite clear, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to put words in their mouths, but certainly the impression I get is that this is partly purposeful to ensure that it is only individuals who are already in the student politics world who are informed, who are able to run. Um, I think that's really distasteful, and that's something I, I really want to democratise, and I think it's, it's time that actually we made sure that these positions are far clearer in terms of the way you get into them, because not only is apathy a problem, but the whole democracy of student politics is a real issue. I mean, particularly junior positions in the student union are often sort of friends asked by existing officers to sort of run in elections where they go unopposed. It, it's very undemocratic. Um, and that's a real concern of mine. Um, you mentioned apathy there. Do you think that there's also a feeling or a sense that in terms of student politics, perhaps particularly uh, at Oxbridge, of an elite engaging in student politics to the detriment of all the other uh, students, and by that I mean people who see themselves as going into a career in politics and are very much engaged with it, as opposed to people who are simply students at the uh, at the university and want to have their representatives help them achieve the best degree that they can. In fairness, and I actually don't think that's a valid criticism to levy, at least at Cambridge, um, just because of the nature of the way that student society is organised. So we have the student union, the, the Cambridge union rather here, which is a big debate chamber, and that actually draws quite a lot of the sort of careerists um, into it, the kind of people who, who see themselves going into party politics later on. And we have quite strong, thriving um, party political associations in the university, and that draws characters. I, I don't know the individuals involved in QC, particularly the higher end, particularly well. But my understanding is actually most of them don't have that motivation. They are sort of student politicians. And in fairness, while I disagree with their platform, I don't think it's a careerist move on their part. Um, do you think that the, um, the NUS... So there's been recent sort of rise in universities disaffiliating from the NUS. You've seen Portsmouth as the most recent example. Do you think that this is something that's likely to continue uh, or do you, and do you think that the, the sort of the NUS is kind of on life support as it were well I think, I think yeah I, no I mean, that's, that's my real fear and as, as I say actually in my manifesto I think in the sort of bottom section one thing that is really concerning to me is I think if the NUS continues on its con current trajectory it risks dying and you know I'm not one of these sort of radical sort of Tom Harwood types who are like oh that'd be great I think that there's real value to having a national student union that can effectively advocate student concerns. So I don't think anyone else is going to do it. And I think that actually, if we stop talking about sort of broader issues like, you know, boycotting Israel, etc., and we focus on student politics, actually, no one else is going to talk about these issues effectively. So I'm really keen to see the NUS survive. But to do that, it's got to reform. Um, and right now, there doesn't seem to be an appetite to do that. Uh, and I think as a result, actually, you know, there, there is this growing movement. And I, I sympathise with it, frankly, because if the NUS isn't going to stop, sort of stop sticking its head in the sand and sort of wake up to the, to the reality of the way that students are feeling and the sort of discontent that's within a lot of student bodies, I, I, I think that the NUS is, is somewhat doomed to failure. And as I said, I think that would actually be a, a tragic mistake long term, because I do think that a student's union properly run is really, really crucial. Uh, this is slightly uh, off the direct NUS question, but it's still related to uh, student experiences. Do you worry that the value of a degree is being somewhat devalued? I mean, we're seeing uh, many more people now going to university than we have in the past. And as a result, we've seen a lot more universities uh, now than we have uh, in the past. Do, do, do Is that something that you worry about? What, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, without sort of trying to sound arrogant, I come from an interesting perspective as a sort of Cambridge student, as this institution, which is, is you know, seems to be quite elite. And as a result, I think there is, there is actually, across the student body in an interesting way, there is a slight sort of snobbishness about other education institutions, even if, you know, you came yourself with sort of disadvantaged background. Um, and I, I think that's interesting. I think that we were always misguided in this country about the number of people who should go to university. Blair's sort of 50% of the university was actually a, a tragic mistake, in my opinion, uh, for two reasons. The first is that it has, as you say, I, I think it has devalued the degree. You know, I, I'm not saying this should be the case, but there was a time when, as a Cambridge student, 
my the fact that I got attended this university and graduated from it alone, assuming I hadn't literally sort of failed on a sort of third, um, would have allowed me to walk into a job. And now that, that's simply not the case. I'm not saying it should be, but there has been. A, I, I'm just using that to exhibit the change that has occurred. Um, I think there are questions about whether the, the government should continue to fund degrees that are consistently not enabling students to return their, their, their money at particular universities. I think that is that is something to consider. But more broadly, as I said, I think the real tragedy is that for their sort of 50% of university, the entire rhetoric that surrounded that, um, encouraged, it essentially de- it encouraged the devaluation of, um, of technical qualifications. And I'm really pleased that we've seen a slight move towards apprenticeships in recent years, but it's nothing like what they have in countries like Germany where actually, you know, that's seen as sort of the benchmark for, for most sort of technical jobs. And, you know, engineers aren't aren't trained in universities. They're trained on the job. Um, and I think that the culture, the way that we've sort of looked down and been quite snobbish about sort of technical qualifications is really damaging. And I think we should be moving back to a, a model sort of where universities are for the kind of sort of degrees that are more academic and require sort of more academic qualifications and degrees where, you know, students are very interested in learning that subject rather than which i think is the fear now is that there's actually quite a large body of students who through no fault of their own see university even if they're not particularly interested in academia not particularly interested in the subject that they're studying don't necessarily see the relevance of the subject they're studying to their future career still because of the culture and what they've been told through school and from the government think that university is a next logical step because that's not good for the students that's not actually good for public finances in, in terms of student debt often and as importantly, it's not good for academic institutions that, frankly, I think should prize academic rigour. And I'm really lucky to be at an institution that does. But I think some have unfortunately lost out on all that a little bit. Not, And I don't mean to, I'm not blaming students when I say that, but I just think that students haven't actually been offered a reasonable breadth of opportunities and haven't been given the chances that actually some of them might have embraced more because of the culture we've created around universities. Um, now, um you mentioned earlier about the sort of more left-wing, sort of radical elements of student politics. Um, and do you, do you worry that this is sort of slipping into sort of parliamentary politics as well? Now we've seen, for instance, Zara Sultana, who was on the NUS NEC, um, now elected into parliament and sort of her sort of radical left politics. Yeah, I think it's a very, very concern. But I think it's, I think it's a problem across um, the, the spectrum. Actually, uh, I think that the, the left. I, I think politics is starting earlier in an odd way, and we've always talked about careerism. Um, but particularly in the Conservative Party, it's been a real problem over the last few years. But I actually think the left has not necessarily woken up to that in the same way, um, and we're seeing a lot of people not at Cambridge, I would say, but sort of more broadly using it as a training ground. And you come with very sort of radical ideas. And it's not even the radicalism, it's the sort of partisanship. It's this whole sort of Laura Pidcock, I couldn't be friends with the Tory sort of narrative that just completely is devoid of perspective. And I think that's the real problem is that student politics, in an odd way, considering how concerned it is with diversity, isn't diverse enough in terms of the opinions it produces. And I think it's really important that students, regardless of their political persuasion, can have friends and have conversations on a regular basis with other people who disagree with them because it keeps you grounded in where society is. And I'm really worried about the sort of marginalisation and the sort of splintering of student politics more broadly, including party politics, to the point where students sort of self-segregate. And that radicalises the narrative within that group because it's sort of um, self-perpetuating. You hear all these people agreeing with you and you slowly radicalise towards a further end. And I think conservatism in student politics is an equally sort of terrifying perspective of that. Uh, That's all we've got time for. Uh, Thank you for listening to the podcast. Uh, If you'd like to subscribe to us, you can do on YouTube, iTunes, uh, Spotify and Spreaker. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, you can do at Debated Podcast. If you'd like to email us, you can do at the Debated Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.